All right, folks, let's get started. How's everybody doing today? So I'm going to finish up talking about um, eukaryotic DNA replication. As I said, a lot of the same structures and stuff are the same strategies we see in eukaryotic uh, DNA replication compared to prokaryotic, but there are some important differences, and those important differences turn out to be really interesting. Okay? So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about those today. It's one of the things that's some of the most common questions, or the most common uh, questions I get in my lectures actually come from this lecture. So. Um, I hope it's because you're interested, not because I'm so confusing. So, but you never know. All right. So, um, I finished talking about repair yesterday. I finished talking about recombination yesterday. So, what I haven't talked about is uh, what happens in eukaryotic cells. So, eukaryotic cells, I'll remind you, are the cells of higher organisms. Plants, animals, even yeast are eukaryotes. Organelle, uh, I'm sorry, organisms that have in their cells organelles. Anything that has a nucleus has a mitochondrion has endoplasmic reticulum, any of these various organelles, if it has those in its cells, it's a eukaryotic organism. Okay? Eukaryotic organisms are more complex than prokaryotic organisms are. All right? A lot of the complexity arises from the fact that, A, there are histones, and the histones are wrapping up that DNA, and there's a lot of consideration that has to be given to unwrapping those histones when the cell needs to do something with that DNA. Okay? So that's a very important consideration. Another very important consideration in multicellular eukaryotes, like us, like plants, okay, is the fact that things can get out of control. All right? Well, let's imagine two situations. Let's imagine I'm a yeast, and let's imagine I'm Kevin Ahern. Some people would say there's not much difference, although the yeast can make beer, and Kevin Ahern isn't very good at that. Okay? Bad joke, okay? I was hoping for a better one than that, but okay. All right, so the yeast has a single cell, all right? That single cell can divide and divide and divide and divide, all right? I have trillions of cells, and they can also divide, but their division must be coordinated, all right? So, for example, the bone cells in my left leg are hopefully dividing at about the same rate as the bone cells in my right leg or I end up walking weird, right? So I have to control how my cells divide. That control of my cell division gives my appearance. It gives me functionality in terms of what I do. And so eukaryotic cells, especially in multicellular organisms, have to control when to divide and when not to divide. We're going to see some things that affect those later on in the term. But I just want to plant the idea in your head that there has to be some control over division versus non-division. Right? In, in the eukaryotic cell, division is controlled at the, each cell's level. And cells go through what's called a cell cycle. You probably learned about this in basic biology. Cell cycle being divided into a period of growth and metabolic activity. Activity, I've got to read those more carefully. All right. We have a synth synthesis phase called S in which DNA is replicated. We have a second phase called G2, in which is growth and preparation for cell division. Division. And finally, mitosis, where the cells separate. Okay? These four phases of a cell cycle are, as they say, are very, very orchestrated. There's very much control over those. And when control of the cell cycle is lost in a multicellular organism, we have cancer. Okay? When we lose control of cell division, we have cancer. That's just given. All right? So the importance of controlling cell division is something I'm going to come back to in a minute. But I want to set the stage thinking about, OK, we have to have some controls about how this overall process occurs. OK, now, in order for cells to divide, cells have to um, replicate their DNA. And there's a lot of detail on here. In fact, the, most, the vast majority of what I'm going to go through here is not of any significance for us. But I'm going to talk about two components of replication of eukaryotic DNAs that are really important okay, and that affect human health. All right? So the first of these is um, 
the cells actually in that cell cycle that I showed you have a quality control system. Quality control. When you think about quality control in a factory, a quality control in a factory is making sure that the output of the factory, that is the material the factory is producing, is of high quality because you don't want to be putting junk out that you're selling. That quality control might make sure that if you're working, if you're producing, let's say, a food product, that that food product is uh, not spoiled, it's all in good shape, etc. So we're making sure that what the factory or the, the restaurant or whatever is putting out is of high quality. DNA replication has to be of high quality. If DNA replication is not of high quality, then what happens is the cell is putting out DNA that's been damaged, has been mutated, and mutation is going to lead to lack of control. So cells have, uh, uh, eukaryotic cells have a built-in system that ensures quality control. And it's really interesting, okay? The system that eukaryotic cells have, or one of the systems that eukaryotic cells have, is called P53. You may have, yeah. One of, the, one of the quality control systems that eukaryotic cells have is called P53. The letter P followed by the number 53, all right? P53 is a protein. And it is what people call the guardian of the cell. It's the guardian of the cell because it ensures that the cell is, has had replication occur with good fidelity and that everything's okay. okay. I won't go into how it does that, but it does that. So let's imagine we've got a cell and it's going along and it's replicating and it's replicating its DNA and its chromosomes and it gets to a stretch where there's a problem. And the DNA polymerase goes, throws its hands up in the air and says, here's a bunch of thymine dimers. I don't know how to deal with this. Okay? The polymerase will stop when it gets to that. So thymine dimers doesn't know what to deal with. Right? So when the cell proceeds through the cell cycle, it gets to a point where P53 raises its hand and says, DNA replication didn't finish completely. It literally does this. Okay? And it will stop the cell cycle in its tracks. The cell cycle will not move forward, and what P53 will do at that point is it will induce the production of DNA repair proteins. So we talked a little bit about DNA repair proteins yesterday. P53 will cause the cell to start making DNA repair proteins, and guess where they're going to go? They're going to go right to that place where replication got stuck, and the repair proteins are going to go and try to fix the damage. Okay? Now, I think it's pretty cool. If we think about this, your car breaks down, you call up somebody, they come out, and they uh, hopefully repair your car. P53 is doing that for the cell's DNA with repair proteins. The repair proteins go to the site of the damage and look to see if they can repair it. If they can repair it, they report back to P53, everything's okay, and P53 says, okay, cell cycle, continue with what you were doing. If they report back to P53, and they cannot repair the damage, P53 will cause the cell to commit suicide. Okay? It will cause the cell to commit suicide. Now, that's really important in a, in, in a multicellular organism. If I have a single yeast cell, for example, and it loses control, is anybody hurt? Nope. If I have a multicellular organism and my chin cells get out of control, am I in trouble? Yes. Okay. So having something to, that, that tells the cells to commit suicide helps prevent those cells that are losing control from taking over. Julia? It's a very good question she's asked. So she says, does that mean that cancer cells don't have P53? Okay. I'll tell you something that is interesting, okay? About 90% of the colon cancers have a damaged P53. Oh, P53 is pretty important, right? Because P53 is ensuring that you got everybody going forward, pulling all the oars in the same direction, right? And when somebody gets out of whack, going to commit suicide so that we don't damage the rest of the organism. So P53 is a very important protein in that process. Okay. Yes, Emily. Good question also. Does it go wrong with the proofreading process? No, it doesn't. Okay. 
So the proofreading process is occurring during DNA replication. And this is a process that's happen, happening after replication has gotten stuck. But, it's, but I can see where you would, you would see that. It's, it, in a sense, it's like a proofreading in that it's making sure everything is OK, but it's not actually proofreading the DNA, no. Yes? That's fine. Okay, so the DNA repair proteins that it's activating are those, the ones that we've talked about. They have different names than the ones we've talked about, but they're performing these very similar functions to what you've already seen. Okay? Pretty cool stuff. All right? So P53 ensures that the cells that are going forward with the cell cycle are those that have had replication occur properly without any big problems. Really neat stuff. Okay? So P53 is an example, we'll talk later in the term, of what I, we refer to as a proto-oncogene. Proto-oncogene. An oncogene is something that causes cancer. We'll talk about the difference later between what a proto, you don't need to know that term at this point, I'll tell you later. A pro, the difference between a proto-oncogene and an oncogene. But you can see that P53 is playing a very important role in this decision about whether this cell is going to be cancerous or not cancerous. If I damage my P53, the cell doesn't know. And it goes forward when it shouldn't. OK. All right, there's a bunch of stuff here. So looking at what's happening in this chromosome. First of all, this is a eukaryotic chromosome. They're linear. They're not circular. In that circular chromosome, I could go all the way around and come back around the other, the other side, right? Or I could do this bidirectional thing, right? And that everything would meet, and everything would be done, and have two perfect circles. All I had to do was just pull them apart. With a linear system, I've got a very different situation. Okay? A very, very different situation. With a linear chromosome, I can replicate all the pieces of the chromosome with one exception. Okay? The one exception is at the very end of the chromosome. At the end of each chromosome, we've got a 5 prime and a 3 prime end, right? We've got a 5 prime and a 3 prime end. How do we make the 5 prime end of a DNA? When we start replication. What do we, what do we make it of? RNA. RNA, right? We use primase to start it. So imagine I'm at the very end of the chromosome, and I will say, OK, well, I want to replicate this guy. I put down RNA, right? So I put down RNA, and then I get a little DNA fragment. I get a bunch of Okazakis, et cetera, right? Everybody see that? I'll actually do it over here. There's my RNA. There's I make it longer. I get some Okazakis, and I'm set, right? Now, in E. coli, what did we do with that? We removed it with Paul 1, right? And then we filled in using the previous fragment. Do you see a previous fragment that we can extend? We don't have a previous fragment. So when our enzyme comes along and it removes the RNA, guess what we have left? We have a gap. When we go to replicate, what's going to happen? We're going to lose that little piece every time we replicate. So because we can't make the five prime ends of our DNAs with a DNA polymerase, every time our cells divide, I hate to tell you guys, you got a fuse that is burning. Okay? That chromosome is getting shorter every time the cell divides. Ah! And I say that because I'm older than all of you guys are, and so my fuse is, that's why my fuse is shorter than your fuse is, okay? My fuse is fjorter, shorter because my cells have replicated more times than yours have. Well, we can imagine we can't do that forever because if we do that forever, I'm not going to have any chromosome left, right? I'm not going to have any genetic material, and of course, I have to have genetic material, right? Well, I've got one insurance policy. Actually, I have a couple, but one main insurance policy I have is my cells know that I have to have chromosomes. And so when I was a little tiny embryo, this little tiny embryo had an enzyme in it called telomerase, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-A-S-E. -E -E. Telomerase had a very cool and magical property that it was able to use a trick to make longer my ends of my chromosomes. What did it do? Well, it carried a little tiny template of its own. There's no template out here to copy, right? 
It carried a little tiny template of its own, and then it copied the template itself. The template that it carried was a small, circular RNA. It's carrying an RNA that it's copying. And it's making DNA from that template. That means that telomerase is a reverse transcriptase also, meaning it's copying RNA and making DNA. I'll slow down. Everybody's writing furiously. Yeah, question back of that. It's a very good question. Let me, let me come back to that, and, and, I, and I'll address that in, in a minute. But, but your question is a very relevant one, yes. Okay? Okay, so I've got telomerase. As an infant, this telomerase went along, and it made my chromosomes longer. What did it do? Well, it was copying this little tiny RNA, and it copies it once, and it copies it again, and it copies it again, and it copies it again, and it does this thousands of times. The same eight, it's about seven to, seven to ten nucleotide sequence over and over, and over, and over, and over, okay? It's making the fuse. The longer that fuse is, the more time I have before the shortening starts running in to the things that really matter, the genes that I need, right? What the telomerase is making is something called a telomere. T-E-L-O-M, gesundheit, <laughs> T-E-L-O-M-E-R. A telomere has a structure just like I described. Thousands of copies of the same sequence over and over and over and over and over. People refer to it as junk DNA because it doesn't code for anything. And you can throw it away and nobody's got any problem until you run out of it. Right? Now, my telomeres are shorter than your telomeres are. I can, I'll wager you that because my cells have been replicating for longer than your cells have been replicating. Some people look at that fuse as literally a measure of a person's life expectancy. Because once you start chewing into the good stuff, you got problems, folks. There's some evidence that that's the case. Yes, curse. That's a very good question. Do dogs have fewer telomeres, and that's why a dog lives less than a human does? Um, I would say the answer to that question is no. Okay? So telomeres, there's an association with longevity, with length of telomeres. Right? But there's much more to the aging process than just that. But it's a very good observation, and I'll, I'll give you some other perspective on that in a second. Okay? They have something like that. They have the run out in the street gene. So uh, in the case of, of, of uh, other organisms, it's, and in fact, the aging process itself is not fully understood. So it's not the length of the telomeres solely that's the, the answer, OK? What I haven't told you is we do have some cells that have a functional telomerase. First question people ask is, will we live forever if we activated telomerase? Well, maybe and maybe not, OK? There's two types of cells that have telomerase in us, all right? Our stem cells have an active telomerase. We've heard of stem cells. They're the ones that you know, seem to have this resiliency and so on and so forth. So they, they, uh, it's useful that they have an active telomerase so they can keep themselves in a relatively youthful state. They turn into other cells in our body, differentiated cells. Stem cells are not differentiated, OK? The other cells in our body that have an active telomerase are ones I don't want to mess with. They're known as cancer cells. One of the concerns is if I activate telomerase in places where it shouldn't be activated, will I, in fact, induce cancer? Yeah, maybe, maybe, OK? Now, this actually turns the, the question around just a little bit because now people think, well, oh, if cancer cells have telomerase, what if I design a drug against telomerase so I stop telomerase? Will I kill or stop a cancer cell from growing? And the initial evidence 
to that question seems to be yes in some cases. Stopping telomerase can, in some cases, slow or stop the growth of cancer cells because they burn themselves out. That's kind of cool. You might have other problems associated with that. Very good question. You very well might have other problems associated with it. There's no drug you're going to take that has no side effects. Okay. Yes, question. Does the length of telomeres vary from person to person? The answer is yes, they will. So the amount of lengthening that happens in the embryo is not completely understood, and there may be somewhat of a randomness to that. Okay. Will I be able to look at my telomeres and decide how long I'm going to live? Probably not. Probably not, because there's other variables here like stem cells and so forth that, that enter into this uh, equation. Yeah? That's a really good question also. So her question is, can factors like stress affect um, uh, telomere length and so forth? And there, is some there are some suggestions that, in fact, stress and certain um, um, things in our diet may, in fact, affect how active our um, telomerase is in our stem cells that may be affecting our overall length of our telomeres. Okay? So yes, those may very well be factors. Okay? Yeah? So the question is, is the telomerase in all of your cells as you're developing as a fetus? The answer is yes. So then what happens once you're born? Okay, so when you're born, what happens? Well, what happened to your fetal hemoglobin? You stop making it. You switched, right? So during the process of development, during the process of differentiation of cells, you have tremendous numbers of changes of proteins that are being made in larger quantities, smaller quantities, not being made in some cases, new ones being made. So there's a very, very wide range of those. Telomerase just happens to be one that gets shut off. Yeah. And probably for good reason. Probably for good reason. I don't want all my cells dividing forever. I think it would be harder to stop cancers if everything had telomerase. Yes, I do. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a fountain of youth, though, wouldn't it? Um, I, I uh, teach a class in the winter term called molecular medicine. And one of the things we talk about in there is longevity and some of the remarkable things that we're learning about longevity at the molecular, ba molecular level. Telomerase is only one of the enzymes uh, that we're interested in, in with that. But you can see with telomerase a pretty direct connection between the function of that enzyme and what you would expect the life expectancy of a cell would be. I'll tell you one other brief story about telomerase, uh, or about, about telomeres, rather, I should say. And that is, um, I don't know if you guys, you guys are probably all so young now, you don't even remember when Dolly the sheep was first cloned, but I'm old enough that I remember that. Okay. Oh, all right. So everybody, oh, yeah, we remember that. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, Dolly the sheep was the first uh, mammalian uh, organism cloned, and Dolly was made by taking uh, a cell from uh, the mother sheep and then... Uh, uh, removing the nucleus and putting into, replacing the nucleus of, a, of an egg cell with that. And um, the question then was, well, you started with a mature nucleus from a mature cell. You're starting out with something that has already shortened telomeres, right? The mother was already an adult, so its telomeres presumably would have shortened during that time. What happened with Dolly, okay? Well, what happened with Dolly was Dolly died early. And Dolly died of what appeared to be premature aging. Oh. Okay. Now, that caused a lot of concern for people interested in cloning organisms because let's say I want to clone a beef cow that is really productive or a milk dairy cow that's very productive. Does that mean it's going to have a shorter life expectancy? And it turns out that, that in some cases organisms appear to behave like Dolly. That is, in some cases they appear to... Uh, uh, age prematurely and die early. Other ones don't. And the mystery appears to be that some cells, when they get um, this transplanted nucleus, start up telomerase. And other ones don't. And it's not really understood why that happens. Okay? So the, uh, 
jury is still out on that in terms of that being an overall problem for a cloned organism, but it's an interesting phenomenon. There's other things people think of. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Very good question. If you take it from a stem cell, would you have the same problems? And my guess, I don't know the answer to that, but my guess would be that you would not experience the same problems. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, questions that people have asked is, well, what about if you have a very old father, you know, who marries an 18-year-old girl and they have a baby? Will that baby have a shortened life expectancy? What do you think? No? Nobody says yes? Well, it's, the father is starting out with some very uh, short telomeres, and that's going to presumably be, be reflected in his sperm. Well, the 18 year old's going to have her own DNA, but, then the, but still, the, the, the baby is the product of both. So I think it's not an unreasonable question. Um, the answer is that the studies that people have done on that is that um, there's not much of an effect. So you guys were right. I tried to fool you. Okay. All right. So anyway, telomeres are really interesting, really cool, and um, very much impact human health. So these two components of replication of eukaryotic chromosomes, the telomeres and the repair systems, are very, very important. Uh, in one case for longevity, the other case very much for cancer. Okay, what's that? That's blah, blah, and there's more of the same thing. This is simply showing you how the telomerase works. I'm not going to require you to do the mechanism for that. And I'm not going to require you to know that either. Okay, so we're done with replication of nucleic acids. Okay, so I want to turn our attention now, after I tell you a joke, to transcription. Ready for a joke? Okay. So I don't have a good song for today, so I thought I would tell you a joke. All right. Um, there's this lady, and she's looking for a present for her husband. Okay. And she goes to the pet store, and she walks in, and she says, I want to get something for my husband, and I just want to get, I'm going to do a little lady very well, but I, I want to get something very different. And the pet store goes, oh, no problem, no problem. He goes out and he grabs, he grabs this giant anaconda, brings it out, lays it in front of the lady, and she says, whoa, that's very different, but I don't think that's what I'm after. Okay, so he takes the anaconda back. He says, no problem. He brings it out, he's got this long, six foot long iguana on a leash. Okay? He says, how about that? That's different. No, I don't think that's what I want. Okay, so he takes it back, you know, and this goes on for about a dozen animals. Everyone's weird, you know, and so forth. And no, I don't think that's what I want. All right, lady, I think I know what you want. You see that bird sitting over there on that perch? Yep. That's a crunch bird. You guys heard this one? Okay. That's a crunch bird. A crunch bird? What's a crunch bird? Watch this. Crunch bird chair. Okay. As soon as he says the word chair, the bird flies up off its perch and goes over and attacks this wooden chair and reduces it to sawdust in a matter of a minute. That's absolutely amazing. He says, you ain't seen nothing. Crunch bird, desk, and there's this great big wooden desk. And the matter of maybe a minute and a half or, some, or so, the same thing happens to the desk. It's sawdust. She says, oh, I've got to have this for my husband. So she takes the bird, and the bird perches on her fingers, a nice, nice little, cute little bird, you know, takes it, takes it home, and she walks in, and he's sitting there, and he's reading the paper, you know, and she says, honey, I got you something for your birthday. What is it? What's right here? He looks at it. It's a crunch bird. Crunch bird my ass. <laughs> no. Okay, now for transcription. Something less fun than crunch birds, okay? All right, so remember I said the central dogma, we had DNA replication. We had RNA synthesis, which was called transcription, and we had protein synthesis, which was called translation. So we're in the middle part 
of the central dogma right now, we're making RNA. The synthesis of RNA is a little similar to DNA, and it's different in several respects. First of all, the similarity. RNA is copied from DNA, just like DNA is copied from DNA. RNA, I trust you know, uses uracil in place of thymine, and uracil forms stable base pairs with adenine. Okay. One big difference is that the enzyme, RNA polymerase, which is what makes the RNA, doesn't require a primer. DNA always required that little primer. RNA polymerase can just start it wherever it needs to. No need for a primer. That's a very big difference. Another difference. During the synthesis of RNA, only one strand is copied. Only one strand is copied. Okay. Another similarity. Replication always goes 5 prime to 3 prime. There are no exceptions. Five prime to three prime. Okay. The strand that's being copied, okay, and this is always always confuses students uh, a little bit. If synthesis is going five prime to three prime, then it must be moving along the other strand oriented three prime to five prime because they're anti-parallel. Remember? Okay. So the DNA that's being made is always 5 prime to 3 prime. OK. Well, there's some other things about the synthesis of RNA that's very different from DNA. One thing I didn't tell you about DNA, and I should have, and maybe I'll mention it right here, is that DNA replication always starts at a specific place. Yeah. DNA replication always proceeds at a specific place. And that specific place has a name. It's called an origin. O-R-I-G-I-N. RNA synthesis starts at specific places also. They're not called origins. Okay. They're called transcription start sites, TSS. Transcription start sites. Now. What do you see on the screen? What you see on the screen are a set of different genes. And transcription copies those genes. Okay? So when we make RNA, we don't make the whole chromosome of RNA. We make little segments. And those little segments correspond either to one gene, or in the case of bacteria, an operon of several genes on the same RNA. But even there, they don't go for a real long ways. How does the RNA polymerase know where to start making RNA? It needs to have some sort of a sign that says, start here. Well, it turns out that RNA polymerase recognizes sequences in the DNA that tell it where to start. It recognizes sequences in the DNA that tell it where to start. Those sequences we call promoters. So a promoter is a sequence in the DNA that tells RNA where to, I'm sorry, RNA polymerase where to start copying. Now, let's look at some promoters. That's what's on the screen. Okay? Here's a transcription start site. Each one is shown in yellow. You see that ones that have a couple means it can start at either one of these uh, bases. All right? You'll notice that, OK, there's A, G, A, T, A. So all the different nucleotides are actually, actually can be used. So it's not nucleotide specific. What is specific is its relation to a couple of boxes that I'm going to describe to you. Okay? So remember that we're looking at a whole bunch of different genes. And we're comparing the promoters of those genes. The promoters are shown in color. These are the sequences that the RNA polymerase is looking for. And when it finds it, it says, OK, here's the place to start. And we start about 10 nucleotides away. All right? 
the very first base that gets put into the RNA is called the plus one. That's, number, that's base number one. Everything that's ahead of that, that is prior to it, has a negative number. So here's the Pribno box, and the Pribno box has a number of minus 10, meaning it's about 10 nucleotides before that. Okay? The Pribno box is interesting if we look at it. Okay? The Pribno box, they're not all identical, but they're all very similar. If we compare the sequences of the Pribno boxes, what do we see? Okay? If we add all the Pribno boxes up across all of the, gene, all of the genes, or the promoters of a cell, 79% of them have the first one as a T, 95% of them have the second one as an A, 44, 59, 51, 96, okay? You'll notice, the, and what you see on the screen are the most common ones of each of the four bases. This guy is called a Tata box also, okay? Because it has TATA. -T -A. And if you remember, which ones, which bases had the weakest hydrogen bonds? A's and T's, right? Well, during transcription, what the RNA polymerase has to do is it has to get in between the two strands and start copying one of them. This, makes, this provides a very easy entry point for the RNA polymerase to get between the strands and get started. Cool thing, okay? Tata box, Pribno box, okay? There's another sequence called a minus 35, and you see that these aren't exact. They vary a little bit, okay? Minus 35 also has a common sequence as we look through it. We don't see that it's as quite as AT rich as this guy was, and that's partly because this guy isn't used to get to open up. It's used to be recognized. The RNA polymerase recognizes this sequence. So it recognizes this guy and it climbs inside of this one. Bind, open, bind, open, bind, open. Okay? That's what it does. It recognizes, oh, here's the sequence we're looking for. Let's go down here a ways and open it up. And sure enough, there's a Tata box and I can open it up and get started with my transcription. Okay, so minus 35 doesn't have a name. It's just called minus 35 sequence. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So it's just an entry point, and then about 10 away from there, it's going to start putting something in. Yep. Yep. It's going to start and move to the right. Yep. So you'll notice that the promoter never gets copied. The promoter never gets copied. The promoter is just there to help orient everything and provide an entry point into the DNA so the RNA polymerase can move along. Okay. Now, if we think about the process of transcription, we can break it into three phases. We'll see that translation can also be broken into three phases. Initiation, elongation, and termination. This means that the process starts at a specific place. It makes an RNA, and it has a relatively specific place where it stops as well. Okay? Cells don't want to make an RNA any longer than they need because if they do, they're going to waste energy because there's not going to be anything on there that's going to be useful for it. So having a precise place to stop or a relatively precise place to stop is very important. Okay? All right, so what happens in this process? Let's start at the top. RNA polymerase is ready to get started. It first of all has to find where's the promoter? Where's the promoter I can bind to? Okay? Well, that means that RNA polymerase has to have something to help it find a promoter. And it turns out there's a little protein called sigma. That's what this guy is here. Sigma is the little pink guy at the top that is holding on to RNA polymerase on one side. And on the other side, sigma's looking for that minus 35 sequence. Looking for it. Where's it at? Where's it at? When it finds it, binds to it, okay, 
things are ready to get moving. Okay? Sigma allows the RNA polymerase to find the right promoter. Okay. After it has helped it to find it, sigma goes away. You see sigma's going away down here. And just as everything's getting started, we put the very first base in. After we put the first base or so in, sigma goes away because it's no longer needed. It's no longer needed to find the promoter because the promoter's already been found. Then the RNA polymerase is off on its own now, and it's making, and look what happens. You see the RNA is hanging off of here. Usually we only have a very short stretch that's base paired to the DNA. Most of it hangs off the end like a tail. Okay. Yeah? Uh, so is every sigma protein unique to each promoter? Or is it oh, very good question. Protein? Very good question. Let me tell you a little bit about sigma, sigma protein since you've asked the question. Okay. So cells have, uh, 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 E. coli cells have a few different ones. Okay. Most commonly, they have one. They have one. And it says, okay, go out and find this promoter. All right? You saw there were different sequences of those minus 35 sequences. And you saw different sequences of the, of the Pribno box, right? They weren't all identical. If I have one sigma factor, we could imagine that the efficiency with which it binds one sequence might be slightly different than binding a slightly different sequence, right? So if a sigma factor, we only use one, if the cell only uses one sigma factor, then some genes are going to be made more than other genes are going to be made because it's going to bind more commonly to one sequence than it's going to bind to the other, right? Well, that kind of makes some sense if we think about it, right? If we think about it, some genes we need a lot of. I talked about that E. coli cell yesterday, and I said DNA polymerase 3 was present in five or six copies per cell. And I said DNA polymerase 1 was present in hundreds of copies per cell. How did the cell know how many to make? Well, one of the ways the cell knows that is by how many RNAs it makes. So the efficiency with which sigma factor binds provides a bit of discrimination for how many of an individual protein is made. Okay? Now, I haven't got to your, your question. I'm, com I'm coming to that. But that's, you start to see how one sigma factor could do that. Well, can one sigma factor take care of all the possible needs that a cell might have? Well, it turns out it can't. I'll give you a real good situation. Okay? Let's imagine that I'm an E. coli cell, and I'm floating around in Kevin Ahern's gut, having a life of luxury. He eats ice cream periodically, and I got all this stuff coming down, and, and uh, I've always got this constant supply of food going by me. And then one day, Kevin Ahern gets sick and runs a fever. Okay. I run a fever, my temperature might go up a few degrees, and you say, oh, a few degrees is not a big deal. Well, a few degrees turns out to be a big deal for some proteins because you've seen what happens when we change the temperature of a protein. What happens? We're going to change the shape, right? We denature, we may have problems, right? So that few degrees of fever might be a situation that's very different. What's the sigma factor going to do now? Well, it turns out that when those conditions arise, it's called heat shock. It happens in almost all cells. Okay? The way that your cells, your cells re recover is very similar. Okay? Heat shock is a phenomenon where the cell has to do a different strategy. And what the E. coli cell does is it makes a different sigma factor when that occurs. Not the usual one, but now one that is only made when there's a heat shock. And guess what? The new one doesn't bind the same minus 35 sequences. The new one starts binding other sequences. Well, why would it want to do that? Well, one of the things it might want to do is it might want to respond to that heat shock, right? It turns out that the new sigma factor will bind to proteins that help proteins to fold properly. I talked about chaperones. One of the things that the new sigma factor will bind to are chaperone proteins. So now the cell is able to respond. And then when everything goes away, the old sigma factor goes back to being made and everybody's set. Make sense? OK. So having different sigma factors allows a cell, an E. coli cell, to respond to different environmental conditions. Being able to respond to different environmental conditions is critical for life. The needs of your cells when you are on 
a starvation diet or running a marathon or going to a tanning booth. You're not going to do that anymore, I hope. Okay? Or any of those things. Your body's got to respond to it. If it doesn't respond to it, it's dead. The way that one of the ways in which our body responds is by controlling transcription. Now, I'm showing it to you in E. coli. E. coli is very simple compared to us, but the same general principles hold. The more RNAs we make, the more protein we're going to make. The fewer RNAs we make, the less protein we're going to make. Okay. Question? Okay. All right. Well, we've done initiation. We've done elongation. I haven't talked about termination. All right. Termination is kind of cool, too. Okay? I'm going to talk about two mechanisms of termination. Right? The first one's called factor-independent termination. Okay? Factor-independent. It means it doesn't take a factor in order for termination to happen. How does this go? Well, here's a DNA sequence that's part at the very end of a gene. It's being copied. The RNA polymerase is moving through and it's copying it. Here's the RNA that it'll make. Remember how I talked about how RNA can pair, how nucleic acids can pair within themselves if they're complementary? Well, look at this. A, U, A, U, A, U, G, C, G, C. Oh, that's very nice. It forms a very nice structure. Well, here's the RNA polymerase. It's coming along. It's making this. It's made all this. And what's, what's hanging off of it is this, right? Part of this is paired to the DNA, I said only a tiny piece of it is, the rest of it's just kind of hanging off. So here's the DNA strand here, here's this, and now up pops this thing. This forms all on its own. Well, I like to think about this thing as like the jack on your car. When it forms, what does it do? It does this, and it lifts the butt end of the polymerase up. And the butt end of the polymerase is sitting on the DNA, and as it lifts the butt end of the polymerase up, the polymerase is no longer tightly attached to the DNA. There's no beta clamp, for example. It falls off. It falls off. Now, there's something else that's cool here. So this guy forms. The butt end gets pushed up. The polymerase falls off the DNA. And look what's left holding this onto the DNA. Use. What's the easiest bonds to break? TA, right? UA also. This guy also falls off because there's nothing left to hold it onto the DNA, just a few hydrogen bonds, and it's out of there. You've just terminated transcription. So this method has a sequence that's built into the end of the gene that causes the RNA polymerase to get kicked off. Okay. Now I've got two minutes, and then I will uh, finish. Okay. I want to tell you about the other one, which is kind of cool too. Everybody have questions on this before I do that? Okay. Factor-dependent termination is a little bit different. As its name implies, it requires a protein factor for this one to happen. Okay? Now, here's a gene being copied. There's a few bases that are being base paired to the DNA. There's the RNA polymerase. Okay? This, one does, this gene doesn't have those sequences built into it. What happens is, look at this guy here. This is a nice little strand. How many people, when they were in high school, had to climb the rope in gym class? Did you like that or not like that? Did or, No, I didn't care for it either. The, the, especially the first time I tried it. I got way up there and looked down. I didn't like that. But then I got used to it, okay? But climbing the rope is no fun. Well, I'd like you to imagine that you're climbing a rope, and someone at the top, instead of holding on to the rope, is letting it out a little bit as you're, as you're climbing. Okay? You don't have a solid rope. You have a moving rope. Well, that's what this is. This is a moving rope, OK? Because the further this guy goes, the more the rope starts hanging off. And what happens is a little protein factor called rho. That's the, that's the Greek letter rho right there. And look at, the sh look at the shape of that. It looks kind of like a beta clamp, doesn't it? Rho has a cool property. Rho will shinny up that rope. It will climb that rope, and as it climbs the rope, it then becomes a race. Which one moves faster, the RNA polymerase or rho? Okay? Now, I won't tell you today how that happens, but I will tell you briefly the end, of, and then I'll finish. Okay? 
It turns out that rho goes faster, and when it gets there and catches up with the RNA polymerase, guess what it does? It lifts the butt of the polymerase up, it falls off, exactly like we saw before. Transcription is done. Make sense? Clear as mud? Questions? All right. Two dollar beers tonight, it bombs away. <laughs> That's where I'm headed. <laughs> I, I wish I were. I wish I were. Maybe later in the term. Maybe later in the term. Yes. With your uh, 